Hello, everybody. I'm Julie Wiskirken from the Authors at Google team in Los Angeles. And today, um, we're excited to welcome Brant Cooper and Patrick Vlaskovitz. And they're going to be discussing their new book, The Lean Entrepreneur. Brant Cooper travels the world speaking to entrepreneurs and consulting and advising startups. His clients include Qualcomm, Mogul, Hubkick, Mother Knows, ITV, Lean Startup Machine, Discover, and many others. He has over 20 years experience in IT and a long track record of bringing high-tech products to market. Patrick Vlaskovitz is an entrepreneur, mentor, and author. He's founded two startups, serves as CMO at Drumby, and co-wrote The Entrepreneur's Guide to Customer Development, a cheat sheet to the four steps to the epiphany. Patrick has spoken at tech conferences nationally and internationally, and serves as a mentor for the 500 startups and for the Lean Startup Machine. So please join me in welcoming Brant and Patrick. Thanks. Thanks for uh, having us here. It's, uh, great to be here. We want to make this really super interactive. We've got a presentation around uh, the challenges of doing lean startup type stuff inside of large successful organizations. Uh, so I'm not sure we've been to a large successful organization that's also traditionally very in innovative like Google. So we'd love to actually have a discussion about some of the things that you're seeing inside of Google, what's working, what's maybe not working. Here's our book. You all get a copy, I believe. So what's sort of the backdrop on this stuff? Do you want to sure. take this off? So um, <clears throat> the, the fundamental premise behind the book and, and why we think the book is important and timely right now is that there is a fundamental shift change happening in, in our economy and in, in, in probably globally. Uh, you've probably heard the expression by Mark Andreessen, the venture capitalist, software is eating the world. Uh, we, um, we buy into this or subscribe to this vision and this idea. And what this means is, is big things, right? So I actually think we're in this sort of perma, perma uh, non-economic recovery. Um, we're seeing technological unemployment, uh, big problems, the middle class is being hollowed out. Personally, I don't think either side of the political aisle knows what's really going on. It is a big problem, right? Um, we're all feeling it. Traditional economic solutions don't seem to be working. Um, and uh, this is the state of the, the, the economy. This is one reason why you're seeing this explosion of startups, right? St startups, uh, you didn't see articles about startups in the Wall Street Journal every day. And the other day, my wife asked me, like, has the Wall Street Journal always been writing about startups? Right? Five years ago, they weren't. Yeah, once in a while, they mention it, et cetera, et cetera. But now you, this, this explosion uh, of startups is sort of a response to this really screwed up economy that we happen to be in. And it's global as well. So we lucky enough to get to travel the world and, and talk to uh, people that are graduating from schools in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and Ireland, and Spain. And all of these people are, are assuming that what they're going to do is start a business. And maybe it's because it's the only opportunity that they have. But that's one side of the equation. There's also, as, as you all know, it's the, the global connectivity, the fact that we're holding computers in our pockets. It's crowdsourcing. It's crowdfunding. It's, the idea that we buy books from software companies, we buy movies from software companies, we do shopping exclusively uh, uh, related to software companies. All existing product companies also have software throughout their company, right? So this is the software eating the world. It's interesting if you talk about uh, talk to hardware people, uh, they're saying that we're at the same stage as open source software. We're in the same stage in open source hardware as we were in, in the late 70s, around the time of the Apple I or the Apple II. And if you think about the amount of change that went on in the software in the last 25, 30 years, it's pretty amazing to think about what, what the next decade might bring in terms of open source hardware. Has anybody seen the, um, the, uh, the photo booths in Japan? You know the. Traditionally, you go to a carnival or whatever amusement park, and you've got the photo booths, and you go in there with your friends, and you're all being all goofy and making funny expressions. You get a strip of film out, right? In Japan, you get uh, 3D printed figurines with your your face on them, right? So that's a pretty. There's a a shoe executive at a forward conference says, within two years, you'll be able to print out your shoes. So you'll just be downloading a shoe style and print it out. Movie executive says, oh, well, you guys now are going to figure out what software piracy is all about. 
It's actually kind of an interesting idea, right? The joke is on the movie industry, if you ask me, though, because they haven't figured out what their business model is. But so anyway, massive amounts of change. Wow, is this thing, there we go. So all sorts of volatility, uncertainty, opportunity, right? So massive changes in the world happening, structural changes, people wondering what they're gonna be doing, people graduating from college wondering what jobs they're gonna have. We believe that this is the, the right opportunity for being fast, agile, and being close to your customer. Right? We think we're, we're, we're moving away from an economy that's concentrating on uh, purely wealth creation and going towards value creation. And so that the winners are the people that understand their cu customers deeply. So why don't you give, a, a, why don't you give the Scott Summit example? Sure, so in one of the, uh... In the book, there's actually a few case studies. I think almost more than 2,000. One of the most interesting we thought was the case study of a guy named Scott Summit. Scott's an industrial designer, and uh, he's been doing some pretty innovative stuff in terms of 3D printing for prostheses. Right? So people come, uh, usually amputees, missing a limb, uh, usually a lower limb, and they uh, go to Scott to get uh, new prosthetics. And uh, traditionally, what a person in this situation would do is they would go and get a, um, a mass manufactured limb, often made in Asia, you know, sort of a rudimentary simple pipe type device, right? And they fasten it on, and then they make sure to put their genes over the device, right, over the prosthetic, and go on with their lives. They actually will stuff socks down in there to actually simulate the shape of a calf. So what was interesting, what Scott's done, he's done, uh, as I said earlier, sort of technological innovation where he actually uses 3D scanning technology to actually scan the, the good leg, then invert it and build a, a digital model of the, the missing limb and then use 3D printing technology to print uh, what he calls a fairing uh, that mimics the shape and feel and weight of, a, of a, the real missing limb. And this is actually fascinating, not only because the technology is you know, sort of the, the, the stuff of, of magic and science, but because the actual business model innovation where people now choose these prosthetic limbs based on who they are and their personality. So if you're into, let's say, motorcycles, uh, you may get this prosthetic limb and it may have chrome on it. If you're uh, into tattoos, you may get your tattoo replicated on there. And what happens is people's behavior actually changes. They no longer hide these, uh, uh, they no longer hide their, their, their uh, limbs, they actually show them off. They actually buy dresses to match uh, the prosthetic. And this is sort of a, what we think is a paragon of this new value creation economy that we're seeing emerge out of this volatility is someone, entrepreneurs or large businesses who are really deeply understand their, their customers on a very deep emotional, uh, perhaps even psychic level about the customer's needs and then innovate both technologically as well as in the actual business model. So again, the lean startup for the win, fast, agile, tenacious, being close to your customer, continuously creating new value. So how do we do this? The backdrop of this is what we, we, we talk about in the book is the innovation spectrum. So if you've read Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma, he uses the term uh, disruptive technology on one side, sustaining technology on the other. Uh, we believe this is a continuum. All companies live on here somewhere. All right. So we have, to, we, like Brian said, this is a continuum. Uh, and uh, this, this thing shades of gray, but we're going to contrast this with two extreme poles. So over here on the side, we have sustaining innovation. This is uh, a car manufacturer, uh, automobile manufacturer coming out with a new body style, right? So I have a 4Runner. I think it's a 2006. This is the 2008 uh, 4Runner, incrementally better on some. It's got a bigger engine. Uh, it's more fuel efficient. Perhaps it's lighter, right? Or this is Gillette razors coming out. You know, you've got 19 blades on your razor. This year, it's got 27. Right, some incremental uh, improvement. What happens over here is, generally speaking, the problem's well understood, the market's well understood, customers are well understood, the marketing channels, the sales and marketing channels are well understood. Right? Here you have execution risk, and here we would say, in, the, in sort of the way we look at the world, traditional business methods are sufficient. Right? So you can go and write a business plan, I'm going to now uh, produce a razor blade that has 35 blades on it, I'm gonna sell to guys like Reggie over here, I know where they live, I know how much money they make, uh, I know why they like my razor versus the Schick razor, and you can go and execute on that thing. That's, that's how we describe sustaining innovation. Right, so disruptive innovation then is completely 
turning a market on its head or creating a brand new market. Market's not understood. It's not known. Problem unknown, solution unknown. New technology, how do we apply it? You go and you talk to your customers, they actually don't understand. You can't believe what they're going to say. Over on this side, you ask your customers, would you buy this? You cannot take their answer to the bank. Traditional business methods do not work so well over here. So Clayton Christensen in Innovator's Dilemma uses hard drives as an example. So tons of data on hard drive companies. Back in the 90s, you had five and a quarter inch drives held 10 megabytes of data. Companies would do real innovation, new materials, processes, double the capacity, 20 megabyte hard drive, sustaining innovation. Go out to your IT manager that bought your 10 megabyte hard drive and you say, hey, you want to double the capacity here? Same cost, maybe even a little bit less. You want it? IT manager goes, yeah, of course. That's awesome. Great. When can I have it? Oh, you pay 150 bucks? Oh, yeah, no problem. Got the budget. You can actually build great return on investment cases here. You know the market, you know the customers, you know how much they'll pay. You can predict the success of that company or that product fairly well. You've got competition, you're fighting your competition there. Patrick likes to say over on this side, you die because your competitors have stabbed you in the back and they're dancing on your grave over here. You're out in the wilderness, out in you the die wilderness. alone, you starve to death, and nobody even knows you existed. So a startup, this is traditionally where it's sort of startups live and, and, uh, and your big businesses do your sustaining innovation very well. Over on the startup side, you're, you're a new company and you produce a three and a half inch drive, holds 20 megabytes of data. You go bring that same IT to that same IT guy, that three and a half inch drive, he thinks it's a paperweight. Has no idea what it's for, has no use for it. So, Big businesses do the sustaining innovation very well. It's not a pejorative. This is where market share is. It's where margins are. It's where the large market is. The disruptive side is all brand new. You don't know if there's a market there yet. Most startups exist somewhere in between. Most startups really aren't all the way over on the disruptive side. They're somewhere in between. But the point really is, is that the practices that you use when you're experimenting or you're interacting with your customers differ based upon where you are on the spectrum. Over here, you can't believe what the customers say. Over there, eh, if you're really over on the sustaining side, you can understand, you can believe what they say. Over here, you're optimized for learning. On that side, you're optimized for execution. You've already learned how to figure out products, features, marketing, sales. So there's actually some things to think about there, right? I mean, in terms of human resources, for example, over here, you need people that are willing to wear, like to wear many hats, tend to like chaos. Over on this side, they like order, inbox and outbox. So we'll dive into that a little bit more. But one, sort of one thing to note, too, is I actually have a theory on this disruptive side. If you're doing something really disruptive, uh, my theory is that your sales and marketing channels, you have to actually innovate on those too. So if you're doing something fundamentally disruptive and you're taking sort of best practices, best practices are on this side, right? Best practices are sort of execution-oriented risk, right? But if you're doing something crazy disruptive, so maybe like Google Glass could be an example, right? If you, if you actually follow sustaining innovation type sales and marketing channels, you're probably not gonna win. So how do you disrupt inside of a large successful organization? So this is the, the innovator's dilemma. Inside of most large businesses, innovation is a buzzword. You can find it right on their about page. We are the most innovative, blah, 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 blah. You see it in their advertisements, right? The, the sustaining innovation uh, uh, SUV that Patrick is talking about. You see that, I can't remember what car it is. It might be actually Mercedes, where the patents are flying off of the car, and this is the sign of their innovation, is that how many patents that they have, and it's all on a vehicle that is sort of marginally improved from the year before. So this is, big business talks about innovation, but most big businesses, when they're talking about innovation, they're talking about sustaining innovation. They're talking about incrementally improving products, product lines inside of a known market. And it's, there's good reason for it. 
Margin, again, margins are good, markets are known, so you can actually measure what you think the return is, is going to be on your endeavors. So if, you're, if, you're, if you own the purse strings inside of a large organization, somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've got this great idea. Here's the market we're going to sell to. Here's what our profit margin is. I think that we should be able to get this sort of return within a couple of years versus this cra the crazy startup guy who's going, oh, I got this really wacky idea, but he has no idea what the market is, whether he could sell to it. You know, if you're in charge of the, your business unit, if you've got the purse strings, which one are you going to invest in? Clearly, you're going to invest rationally in the existing market. So that's, that is the innovator's dilemma. Two questions that kill disruptive innovation. What's my ROI, and when am I going to see it? The only way you can answer that question is to look at existing markets. So you're pulled over to the sustaining side. And we see this all across the world when we're going and talking to entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs inside of these large businesses. They've actually been charged with going out and doing, quote unquote, real innovation. And yet they come back and their business managers say, OK, well, what's the return on investment? And it's the equivalent of, of writing a, a business plan, which nobody does in startups anymore, right? So back to that spectrum, sustaining side, you can write a business plan that's believable. Disruptive side, your business plans are just pulled out of thin air, right? Over on the sustaining side, if you have your requisite hockey stick revenues, it's based on real data. On the disruptive side, completely made up. It's like an inverse mullet. You just draw it so it's business in the front, party in the back. So we see this all over. When is the ROI? This is actually when we're doing a, uh, for traditional corporates, when we're doing this in a workshop, this is actually where Patrick and I have to pause because on opposite side of the room, there'll be a, a, a PM and, and her boss, and they'll just sort of lean across and they'll start talking to each other about the mistake they made in terms of these questions being asked. So how do we get beyond that? Here are some of the typical approaches to innovation. Uh, you know, you go hire big four, big five, how many consulting firms are left of the big guys? You go hire those guys and they talk about, they come into, they do rally. Instead of Patrick and I standing up here, it'll be a sort of a management guru and we'll just fire you up and get you, inspire you to go and be innovative, go be internal visionaries. Patrick and I's version of that is the myth of the visionary. The other thing big businesses do is they create these labs and they have sort of these brilliant people working in these labs tinkering with new technology and yet that te technology never sees the light of day. Usually it's because somebody goes waltzing through there and goes, oh yeah, that one's good, nah, that's not so good, you know, sort of this pick a winner strategy and they take this technology and they throw it over the transom to the core business and then they sort of wonder why that product fails. It doesn't work. So then there's the, the management team that sits around. I've sat on this management team before in, a, in smaller companies. And, we, and again, you sort of go, oh, we're going to give $250,000 to this group, and nobody else gets any. They make this one big bet on an internal startup. And like most startups, it's likely to fail. And so there's the, their one shot, and they go, oh, god, this stuff doesn't work. Other ones try to turn core business into a startup. And that's a great way to kill your core business. And then finally, there's the build the startup inside the core business. And so what we see here, you know, there's some benefits. You get an entrepreneurial spirit, this culture of experimentation, optimized for learning, lots of chaos, Nerf guns, super cool, right? You try to do this inside of a large enterprise, and you've got some problems. Large businesses got large because they learned how to execute. If you kill that because you want to be startup-y, you're killing where all your money's coming from. You can't just take a large organization and turn it into a startup. You have brand issues. You have legal issues, regulatory issues often. You've got marketing people that know how to market to a particular segment. You've got salespeople that need to uh, 
uh, earn their commissions by selling their core business products. You start giving them these startup products and creates all sorts of inefficiencies. Nobody's smarter than sales guy how to optimize their commission, right? So they start bundling their products together, bundling the new stuff with the old stuff, anything they can do in order to earn their money. Uh, we were talking to a, a, a big company that actually does some of this stuff pretty well, and the, uh, uh, an internal startup would reach a certain level and they would throw their core business support into the startup world and suddenly, their whole support organization gets sucked into problems that are emerging with this new product. So it's not just that the startup has to be protected from the big business. The big business actually has to be protected from the startup. So what we, what we try to work with uh, some of these companies is how do you build this lean startup mentality inside of the large business? You run multiple experiments, not a pick a winner strategy. Use validated learning to measure uh, measure the progress of these companies instead of just revenue. We found that uh, uh, this one company in particular had struggled with the whole persevere or pivot. And he was actually, I thought it was really interesting, he, he said, you know, management needs to actually urge companies or these internal startups not to pivot. They want to pivot too early. The moment there's any trouble, they want to pivot. And actually, if you can flip the motivations around so that the management is actually telling them to persevere, uh, that they saw bigger wins that way. But you have these different stages inside of these internal startups that are, again, it's measured by validated learning, not revenue. So things like number of passionate users, um, you know, what's a viral coefficient, if that's uh, important. Uh, you start learning what the lifetime value is, cost of acquisition, you're testing marketing channels, testing innovation of the marketing channels. Then you have these stage two internal startups where they have to prove out their business model. What other market segments can we go after? Is it scalable? And, and you have the, now you can start looking at revenue, but again, it's really about the, sustained, uh, uh, the sustainability of this startup and whether it's scalable. And you do all of these things, which can take years before you start migrating these uh, internal startups into the core business. So actually, since we're at Google, we should also talk about what I think how Google, at least up to now, sort of solves this problem. What I think happens here, I'm not a Googler, so I, I don't have any uh, knowledge, uh, inner knowledge, but what I think happens at Google actually is that basically these internal experiments leave in the form of folks leaving and start doing their own startups and then they go to get acquired, right? So you get acquired, when you get acquired, that's your bonus for doing something innovative, right? Which, if that works for Google, that's fine. I don't think that works for a, lot of a, of a bunch of other large companies, because actually I think what you can actually start doing is start spawning competitors very quickly. And so, part of this message is about how to, how to create these internal experiments, create internal startups, is to keep the innovators in-house, keep them happy, and make sure to incentivize them the right way. Or even figuring out what the application of the technology is. If right. it's just technology that's being developed, then what is the right product out of that technology? And the way the startup world figures that out is actually going and validating that, that, that there's a product there. Whereas if you just have a labs approach, then typically, in my experience, either the technology never leaves the lab, or if it leaves the lab, it goes straight from lab to core business. And so somebody's actually walking through the lab, and based upon their own visionary status, their ability to predict the future. But so it ends up that the managers then are going, oh, I know how to pick winners. I'm the highest, highest paid person in the room, so I'm going to pick which technology is the winner. And then I tip, pluck it out, put some money behind it, and go throw it to the core business without actually ever validating whether there's a market for that technology or a market for that particular application of technology. Who's the right customer? Who's the early adopter? Who's the, uh, how do I market and how do I sell to those people? So that's my experience with, with the traditional lab approach. One pattern we see quite often is when it gets kicked out of lab too early into the, and it gets kicked over the sales folks, like Brant mentioned earlier, right? Uh, the sales folks go, what is this? I'm not sure, do my customers care? They're, they're focused on meeting their targets, making sales, right? Being the economic engine of the organization. And you've actually given them another task now, right? The, the difference between selling something and then discovering how to sell something is non-trivial, right? Does anyone, does anyone know what I'm talking about here, right? 
it's a, it's a, there's a fundamental sort of discovery function that happens on the uh, disruptive side, right, and the execution on the saving side. And uh, we see this over and over again, where great technology you know, shoots out of the lab, lands in the sales um, woman's lap, and it, she's, she's, again, she's tasked with making sales, making commissions, not discovering, and then she's able to do things like bundle it with other products, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, anything to sort of get it off the radar. And then ultimately the product ends up dying. So does that mean like we can have a lab, but we need to have a separate active strategy for the lab? That's right, so, so organizations that have labs, so I, I, we sort of have a three-stage framework, which is internal startup, uh, that's proving you know, customer passion. Second stage is proving the business model. Third stage is the core business. Where there's labs, I just think it's a fourth stage, and that would be sort of stage zero, which is the lab is, is coming up with new technology, and then that needs to go, it, you need to have, find somebody that wants to take that idea and turn it into an internal startup. So you go from stage zero to stage one then. So there's nothing wrong with the labs, the, 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 the problem has been traditionally what we do with the technology that's inside the labs. And super huge companies, right? Xerox PARC, HP, I mean, these are companies that had brilliant technology that never saw the light of day. And I really, my belief is, I, I did a startup in the late 90s, right? It actually crashed at the, the dot-com crash, where we took HP technology out of their lab and we were bringing it to market. And this is what we would hurt. We did this tour of HP Labs, and there's just scientists and these brilliant engineers, and they would sit there and go, yeah, you know, this kind of sucks. None of our stuff ever sees the light of day. There was no method of getting that stuff out. So on the, on the flip side, protecting the core business from the startup, you, you, need, you need a set of ground rules, right? So sales and marketing are not given these startup products. Legal comes up with ground rules. So if you're a startup and you want to do this experimentation and you follow these ground rules, then you don't have to go to legal to get approval. This is huge because the whole idea in the startup world is doing experimentation fast. Uh, so we've run across these companies. There's 7-Eleven uh, is a great example. They actually uh, brought us in for lean startup stuff, 7-Eleven. They have an internal structure responsible for experimentation, but it took five months to get the results for one experiment. So if you imagine you're, a, you're a, uh, somebody inside this large organization, you want to do something new, you come up with an experiment, give it to this organization, five months later, you get the result. Like most results of experiments, that first iteration was a failure. You're all like, eh, I'm done with this. I'm going back to my job. If you get five months to get an answer, so the whole, the whole point here is to be able to put together processes that allow you to move quickly. And one of those are, here's the legal ground rules. Here's the web terms of service template. If you use this, you don't have to contact us. There's all sorts of other issues, though. So I mentioned the, so startups seem really super sexy. So even if you're this process-oriented person, you go, oh, I'm going to go jump into this startup that actually might cause a problem. So there's some HR issues that need to be thought of. I don't know if HR is the right place for them to come out of, but it's important to understand who are the resources. If you're on, in the chaos side, you want people that thrive in that sort of atmosphere versus the people that thrive in, on the execution side, on the process-oriented side. So uh, support staff on core products only, how do you interact with existing customers? So this is a big issue for a lot of big companies. They don't want their startups running experiments on their millions of customers, right? So how do you take a sliver of those customers and run some experiments? Do you threaten the brand? You go and you run a, a, an experiment and you throwing out in classic minimum viable product, you throw out you know, some crappy product, right? Didn't quite reach viable. You want that associated with your brand? Maybe not. So you create a labs brand or a fake brand and really do this experimentation under this, uh, under this fake brand. So there's all sorts of ways that the, if, if it's thought through, the core business can actually be protected from the startup. And this is something I think Google has historically done very well, right? Google Labs has, has, uh, has certainly had a, um, quite a few really interesting experimental products, right? So, Assuming one buys all into this and we're gonna build lean startups inside of an organization, I'd like to take a, 
a, a quick step back and sort of give the background on how we, our take is on how this lean startup stuff evolved. So hopefully by now we all know that lean does not mean cheap, does it mean small, does it mean don't spend money or don't raise money. Lean comes from lean manufacturing, which describes the way Toyota was building cars in Japan in the 50s. So lean is all about the elimination of waste. Right? So in the manufacturing sense, you had a known product, known problem, known solution. I'm building a car, maybe a minivan for a soccer mom. And so uh, I have what's called value add activities. I'm actually assembling the car. And then I have non-value add activities, which might be I'm forklifting parts from one side of the warehouse to the other. Not, doesn't actually contribute to the value that's being created. So in lean manufacturing, what you try to do is make as efficient as possible the value add activities and eliminate as many of the non-value add activities as possible. Some are necessary, but you try to eliminate them. So there, in, in lean manufacturing, there's these concepts of flow and pull, and basically that's starting with customer demand. You only built parts and product as the downstream process demanded the part from you or the process from you. So it created this one piece flow so each car was actually made in whole before, before the next, all, all based upon demand. Okay, so that started eliminating things like space required for, for parts, for inventory, because you only made what was, what, what was demanded. So that was a way that they could then start eliminating some of these non-value add activities. So in a lean startup, the difference is you don't actually know the value that you're creating and you don't know for whom. So you think you know, right? You have a business plan that has documented all that you think that you know. But until the transaction actually happens in the marketplace, you don't truly know. Not until somebody has paid you some sort of currency for the value that you're creating. Now I know, right? At least I'm starting to begin to know. So it sort of begs the question though, if you don't know the value that you're creating and you don't know for whom, how do you know what activities are wasteful or not? How do you know how to eliminate non-value add activities? So Eric Ries talks about validated learning. So if you're not learning, if you're in a state of unknown, if you're not learning, you're wasting. And so the Lean Startup, we try to use a set of principles that allow us to learn, continuously learn. Now it's important to understand that once you learn, then you execute, right? So this is the path from sustaining innovation or from disruptive innovation to sustaining. You start out in a state of unknown, you're running experiments, interacting with your customers in a particular way in order to learn, in order to know, and as you know, you execute, while continuing to learn what's still unknown. So people sort of get this stuck in their head that they always need to be creating minimum viable products. Well, actually, once you've learned what's viable and that there's a market segment, now you've got to start executing. We're not always in MVP mode. We're in MVP mode in order to learn upon what to execute. And in fact, uh, when we were talking about the, the, uh, the innovation spectrum, right, if you're doing an MVP on the sustaining side, you're doing it wrong, right? The context is there, the, the market is there, the customer's there, all those things are known. You don't want an MVP, you actually want a whole product over there, right? So we sometimes run into startups like, oh, I'm doing an MVP, and I'm, you know, basically they're, you know, ripping off some known uh, uh, product, right? MVP aren't helpful. MVPs are helpful as experiments on the disruptive side, right? They're trying to actually derive knowledge out of this sort of unknown, chaotic space. So the way we help uh, some startups, some organizations, large and small, think through the learning process is what we call the, the value stream discovery exercise. So again, the value stream is comprised of all the activities that a business goes through in order to make a customer first aware, all the way to delivering the value. And in between is the discovery of the value. So 
uh, so we have this model where we look at seven states that a customer goes through, emotional states from a buyer's perspective, from a customer's perspective, the states that they go through, and then what we look at are what are the four things we can look at through each state? What does the company do to get the customer to this particular state? What is the impact on the customer? So why do they believe they are in this state? Why are they feeling this way? What action do I take as a customer when I achieve this state? And how do I measure that action? And if one can discover that for their whole product, then what you've got is your growth engine, minimum viable product, this magic moment of conversion where somebody is willing to pay or maybe sign up, uh, the marketing funnel, and then your acquisition channels. So you, you have a set of hypotheses that cover your whole, what we call the startup model. So like Steve Blank likes to say, startup is not a small version of a big company. So I like to say, well, a startup doesn't need a business model then, a startup needs a startup model. And these are the five components of the startup model. We've got a set of assumptions now from aware to passionate, and now we can go and try to validate these and iterate on them until we discover each step. When you're actually doing it in practice, you start with hopeful, satisfied, and passionate. So you, you, you may go out and, and get tranches of users and test your, your marketing uh, as you get tranches of users in order to validate that you're actually building something that somebody wants, something somebody needs or desires. But you're not optimizing your conversion or your funnel or your acquisition until after you've nailed passion. So marketing, your funnel, your acquisition, marketing is not about creating buzz. Marketing is amplifying the buzz that your product creates. So people should already be wanting to share your product. They should be putting new people into the top of your funnel without you spending a dime on marketing. That's when you know you're ready to start hitting the pedal. So what we're hypothesizing here, what's the minimum functionality that we need to fulfill the promise? So what is the promise you're making to a customer segment? Fulfilling that minimally, iterating on it until you have what we consider a, a level of satisfaction, which is a hypothesis that you make. A satisfied customer clicks on features A, B, and C four times a week. That's a satisfied customer, a hypothesis. Measure that. If you're not achieving it, either you need to iterate on the product, look at a different market segment, or change your hypothesis. You're iterating that on that until you nail the satisfaction, and then what's the difference between Satisfaction and passion. So this is the money question. And what's interesting is that it can be outside the product. Yep, you might be able to nail the user experience. The user experience is so awesome that people are passionate. But it could be something that's outside of it. It could be, as Patrick mentioned, it could be that you've innovated inside of the marketing that creates people's passion. So HubSpot is a great example they're, the people that share their content the most are not paying customers. Their marketing itself creates value. And, and so they have this huge constituency of people that love HubSpot, even though they can't afford the product. Yet they're using the free tools, they're sharing the blogs, they're sharing the eBooks, and expanding the market reach out to people that actually can't afford it. Big brands are doing this, right? So brands that go green, or brands that uh, change their packaging to make their packaging more accessible, or uh, donating money to, to, uh, to charities. These are all ways that big brands are trying to pull you in to become passionate about, about their particular brand. Other ways it's, it's separate, you know, I, I have this, uh, this little uh, survey project that I'm doing, and my customers are probably only passionate about my product when their business succeeds. Yet I can only help them so much with my product, right? They have to be a good business person too. So what might I do to induce passion? Well, I might try to teach them to become better business people. HubSpot actually does this as well. So if I can get them to grow their business, then they'll equate their success with my product. So uh, one of the, in our workshops, one of the examples we like to use is uh, 
American, I have it in my pocket right now. Uh, American Express Platinum Card I actually have. And I swear to God, we're not sponsored by American Express, even though we should be. Um, Here you go. Oh, that's a card right there. So that card right there, functionally, it's a credit card like any other, right? You swipe it at the store, I get the item, and then later on I pay my bill, right? It's a credit card. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of credit cards probably available in the United States, right? Yet, I love that card. Right? Why do I love that card? Why do I use that card exclusively when I travel? The reason why is um, they've induced passion in me because it goes far beyond the functionality of the product. And this is something we talk about in the book is, what am I really hiring that product to do? What am I really hiring that, pro that credit card to do? I'm actually hiring it to, uh, to um, uh, solve my, my, my vanity and security. Because the, the reason I use that credit card is it gets me to airport lounges for free. Right? It makes me feel awesome. Right? That's what it does. That credit card makes me feel amazing. Right? Sounds sort of goofy. Right? Sounds sort of, but that's exactly how you get passionate uh, users. Right? Functionally, it's a credit card. Right? Just like any other credit card. I'm going to belabor this point. But it makes you feel awesome. So I can go to almost any, other, any lounge, uh, airport lounge. When Brett and I do a lot of traveling and speaking and, and, and consulting. And guess who gets to go walk in, flash his card, and sit down? Makes him feel awesome. Right? So what am I hiring that product for? I'm hiring it because apparently I'm vain and insecure, and I need, uh, uh, I, I need uh, um, affirmation. affirmation, thank you. I need affirmation of my, of my, uh, of my. Uh, and how did you learn about this card? So how did I learn about it? Actually, you told me. Right. right. So I must be vain and insecure as well. Exactly. <laughs> the, po the point is this passion stuff, it always goes really, it goes much deeper than, than pure functionality. Often we talk to very passionate founders, they're like, I built this great product, does X, Y, Z, and they're, they're sort of stuck and satisfied. Right? Yeah, it does it, right? And so it's like, sort of like a sandwich I had yesterday. I had a sandwich, fine sandwich, satisfied my hunger, I got up and went back to work. Right? Did I tell anyone about how great the sandwich was? No. Right? It didn't meet this, this really deep You know, the uh, other great need. example I like to, to differentiate is when we went to uh, Vancouver. Right? We're going, I'm buying breakfast before, before our talk. And... Uh, I chose the, like the most expensive thing. It's just a little hole in the wall breakfast place. I chose the most expensive, you know, eggs, bacon, all this, you know, and it came with a small coffee, which I thought was really pretty odd. And I'm all like, "Yeah, can you just make that a large coffee?" And they're like, "No." I'm like, "What? They didn't just make it a large coffee." Oh well, you know, we can substitute this. It'll cost you an extra buck ninety-five and blah blah blah. And I'm all like, "Wow!" So I did it, bought it, sat down. It was okay. And I was, Patrick and I were talking about this. You know, this is the, maybe the downside of doing what we do is we look at everything through this lens. But anyway, Patrick then told a story of the evening before, right? Yeah, so we were at this conference in Vancouver. I had actually gone to this restaurant across the way. I had uh, sat down by myself. I was, I was waiting um, for Brant to arrive or my wife to arrive. Uh, had dinner, ordered some food, and I, and I felt like a lemonade. So I'm like, hey, uh, I don't see lemonade on the menu. Can I have a lemonade? The waiter's like, we don't have it on the menu, but I'll make one just for you, right? Guess who felt awesome? This guy right here, <laughs> right? Guess who told everyone about that uh, restaurant? By the way, it's called Cardero's. It's right on the pier uh, near Vancouver, right, right near the West End. And the breakfast place that you should avoid is right across the street. But so the interesting thing, though, actually, real quick when we go next, but this, this the stuff we're talking about, this passion stuff, I actually think for the best entrepreneurs in the world, they think about this stuff, and they, think, they go way deeper than functionality, right? So the other day, I was driving home from Santa Barbara, we were on the PCH in Malibu, and we were uh, stuck in traffic, and we we're right next to Nobu, which is a very high-end sushi chain, if you guys are familiar with it, right? I was looking at Nobu, I'm trying to figure out, what's, what, what are they really selling, right? I mean, superficially, they're selling sushi, right? Really good sushi, theoretically. But what are they really selling? And then I noticed there's two Ferraris, and then two guys who looked like they owned the Ferraris were sitting there talking. I'm like, oh, I get it. What they're really selling is, uh, if you're a high net worth individual, here's where you meet other high net worth individuals. Right? That's what probably makes, not only is the sushi great, but you see you, you like birds of a feather flock together sort of thing. Right? Did you go eat there? No, I did not. No, no. The point is this passionate, I'm actually sort of, I, I, I like to think of myself as a decent marketer. And if you can imbue this, figure out this passionate part of the, the startup model, I think you see some really powerful dividends on that. Something most people, I think, don't quite get. So we like to look at through this lean startup stuff through the lenses of, Understanding your customer deeply, how you interact with them,
how do you run purpose-built experiments to test the viability of your ideas, and of course, measuring the, the right data. I'm guessing Google does data pretty well. So one of our most favorite examples is AppFog. Has anybody heard of AppFog? So uh, they're up in Portland, yep. right? Uh, so Lucas uh, Carlson, the CEO, the founder, is a, kind of a classic hacker type, hangs out on Hacker News, he's always got several projects going, never hit his home run, though, and he would, really wanted to. He didn't want to just be this hacker guy. He actually wanted to build a business, scalable business. And uh, he's a PHP programmer. And a bunch of people were sort of chatting on Hacker News about the need for these cloud services, sort of the Heroku for PHP. Uh, cloud services already existed for uh, Ruby, another development language, and that was Heroku. So people were talking on Hacker News about the need for this sort of services for PHP. And Lucas says, OK, I'm going to do it. So it's like late Friday night. He's getting ready to start coding, like he always does, just going to dive in. But it's kind of late. His wife says, oh, come to bed. Work on that tomorrow. And Lucas goes, all right. So he puts up a classic Tim Ferriss-esque uh, landing page, right? One page website, puts his messaging, positioning, hey, you want to join my beta program, click here. Posts that on Hacker News and goes to bed. Wakes up the next day, 800 people signed up. He's all like, wow. OK, I got something here, maybe. But I just promised these people to enter a beta program that doesn't exist. So he starts coding. Coding, coding, coding. Week goes by, coding, coding. Two weeks go by. Month goes by, and he's all like, if I continue down this path, building this rock solid platform, cloud services platform, it's going to take me six months, a year. By this time, he's got 4,000 people signed up for his beta program. 4,000. So like, if it takes me a year, what's going to happen? I'm going to lose all of these people. So he decides to run what we call a high hurdle experiment. So this is where. Um this is why I actually think sort of a stroke of genius, is uh, he knew he couldn't support all 4,000 people. Uh, the, the product certainly wasn't ready for it. He didn't have uh, time for it. So what he needed to do is actually surface who his early adopters were. Right? And so typically what happens in this case, most startups sort of just open the, the, the gates. Say, We're open for business. Come on in. The stroke of genius was that, that Lucas actually made them surface themselves by showing pain. They actually had to trade in, in some sort of currency. It wasn't money, it was actually time. So he did a, uh, uh, developed a survey, open-ended, multi-question survey, where, like open text fields, right? Like minimum 1,000 words, et cetera, et cetera. You know, what's the meaning of life? What's your favorite color? Super open-ended stuff. It took you 45 minutes to get through, right? So this wasn't a typical marketing, online marketing thing where it's like three questions, don't ask them for their email address, radio buttons, and just hit submit, like just where you get you know, high conversion rates. Right, but not very much uh, fidelity or detail on data. Right, this is if you want access to AppFog, jump you, through this hoop. Jump through these hoops and these four more hoops. Right, because he was he wanted to sort of winnow down this this group of four thousand to a few dozen. Right, what happened? Long story, cutting a long story short, fifty percent of the people converted on that survey. Right, to four thousand to two thousand people. He actually then read all 2,000 responses. He also did some, uh, uh, did some uh, data mining data mining as well. Turned out the, the three things that he thought were most important were not. Long story short, he's seen sort of exponential black swan-like type growth. He's doing really great. Ended up raising $10 million, $10 million recently, uh, last year. They're growing steadily. Uh, the point, though, is really, though, what he needed to do right, he did a lot of things right, but he surfaced. He actually made these early adopters pay for you pay for the product, right? So people who aren't going to pay with their time aren't probably going to be good at early adopters for this. All right, so I love also that he did market segmentation really there. The fact is he knew where his market hung out. They were, he was one of them, but he didn't just listen to himself. He went out and there was all these people on Hacker News. So that was, was actually good marketing. Uh, he didn't necessarily just believe a lot of startups, oh, I got thousands of email addresses. And they go, oh, yeah, I'm good to go. You know, a bunch of people gave me their email address. But he didn't believe that. He doubled down and, and really made these people prove that they actually wanted his product. 
And then what he built was, was a classic minimum viable product. He actually, instead of building the rock solid platform, based on the data that he had gathered, made just three or four features. Imagine three or four features on the, the user interface. What is the minimum I need to do to fulfill the promise I've made to these people? Put that on the user interface and then just built the back end for those three or four features and launched. And it's funny, I, I was telling the story at my coffee meetup down in San Diego and three or four of the people in the coffee meetup were like, I remember that, I was on that. God, that product sucked. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, but did you use it? Did you, oh yeah, it was the only thing available. Right? So I mean, it gave him the platform, it gave him the start of where to iterate on, where to, what was his launching point? You know, was this minimum viable product? And that's what he built, he's built a whole scalable company around. It's a fascinating story. Good, well that's what we got for you. So we'd love to, uh, we'd love to hear more about what's going on at Google. So anybody have some good stories here at, at, or issues that, that uh, Google's facing or what you guys do well and yeah. Like for internal processes or? Internal processes or, or teams and just uh, you know, how you Yeah, well that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, well I mean I think that the, you're almost talking about that at, at what I'm calling the stage two, if they graduate from stage two and a particular product has proved its business model, instead of turning that over to a core business, you just let it continue to function let it grow organically into a core business of its own. Is that? So I, see, no, I think what you're saying is, what, I think that the way that problem gets solved in the startup world, I don't know about the large org world, is you have cross-functional teams that sort of naturally mutate to the right response to the market, if that makes sense, right? And so actually we talk about cross-functional teams. I think with the way that product management, product development is changing because of this sort of hyper-connected you know, software economy we're living in, I think you're gonna see what you're talking about, right? Instead of these functional lines of business, like. You know, marketing hands it over to sales, right? And you have these siloed. I think you're going to see more of this, um, in some cases, more of these cross-functional teams that basically mutate to the proper market response. Does that make sense? No. Yeah. I mean, you're always going to have frontline sales and large enterprise, right? A large company like this will always have, if you sell that, right. that's where we make most of our money. You're always going to have people that are only talking to customers. Right. Doing a completely different selling model versus what the core business is doing. Exactly. Uh, yeah, probably, I don't think I actually can come up with examples. Yeah, like investment banks too, like when they yep. have this coverage model and it's like one guy that's like the quarterback and then they pull in the product specialist to fill their meetings after meeting, that kind of thing. But well, I've seen it around like market segments, like, uh, I mean, Intuit's acquisition of Mint was really going way outside of their comfort zone because they had no ability to market and attract that particular constituency, but it also, uh, they did already have online sales, so it's not like they completely changed their sales model. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure. I think that there's a natural, I think that there's a natural growth where uh, organizations start online and then they evolve to field sales or vice versa so that they're covering different uh, channels, but I think it's driven by market segments more than it is by uh, looking or concentrating on specific selling models. Right, so I mean your market segment is actually, this is one of our problems actually with some of the business model canvas stuff is that it presumes that you're making decisions about your market segmentation and your uh, sales channels and your marketing and your partners sort of independently. And actually your market segment drives all of that stuff. Right, so if you choose a particular market segment they expect to buy in a particular way and so if you chose field sales and you're doing a segment that expects online sales, then you've got a fundamental mismatch. The, the, the sort of esoteric analog I like to use is like you're, doing a, you're playing a game of like simultaneous equations, right? Your market segment, the channels, your product, right? You're, those are all independent variables that, that you actually have to sort of solve for at the same time, right? Simultaneously. And if you do that right, you have like a, uh, uh, a scalable business, right? And if you double down, let's say you hold one constant, then you have to make sure the others fit, right? Um, and so what you're saying is you should let the sort of the sales channel flip. You should be able to flip that variable and let the other server solve for that, right? 
how, how, to, how to change the sales model. Yeah. I've seen some, I've seen, you know, you know who are some of the most interesting people that do some of this stuff are the, uh, uh, sort of the mercenary affiliate marketers and direct marketer stuff, like the guys that, that are, they actually buy a lot of, uh, 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 you know, they have big PPC spends. Those guys are pretty aggressive in experimentation. They, they almost don't care what they sell as long as they make money. I've actually seen, I have friends in that space, and they, do, they often are very open to experimenting in terms of uh, uh, sales models, often because their concern is their sales spend, right? That's, that's sort of the driving concern for those people. But I've seen those people do sort of small scale experiments. Nothing, those are generally you know, uh, not very large businesses. I think most of the examples I can think of off the top of my head come from acquisition. And so they're acquiring somebody that has a different sales model. And the question then becomes, do they, do they try to suck it in or do they let it go and let, let it you know, continue, continue to just be what made that company successful and why they want to do acquire it? But I can't think of, off the top of my head, large organization that's running experiments around changing a sales model. Um, but I don't, I don't see why, I think part of the lean startup stuff gets stuck inside of engineering departments and there's just really no reason why it can't be started over in marketing or sales or PMs. I mean, I think it's really the concept of allowing people to take a percentage of their time and do whatever they want should be across the board, all functions, and then having individuals like that the ability to go out and run their own experiments like that. Yeah, so I mean, so it depends on what the product is, but I mean, uh, so the stage one. Right, so it's all based upon your hypotheses. So everything that you're doing is just starting with a hypothesis. If I do X, customers will do Y. Or a percent, so, Y percentage of customers will do Z. So, uh, so if the experiment fails, if you know why it failed, right? If you don't know why it failed, it's like, oh, we, uh, that didn't work, right? That's, you much prefer, oh, that didn't work because turns out my customers don't like blue lollipops. Turns out they actually hate them because it reminds them of I don't know what, right? That's actually, you've learned something and then you can actually build up uh, sort of this body of knowledge and theoretically pivot to something that works, right? But it's actually, one, it's actually an interesting question because one of the large companies we work with, they have these entrepreneurs who've talked about that. You can actually go through a cycle of learning a tremendous amount and the, the actual project fails. And right now, the structures and the processes are set up like, oh, your project failed, ergo, you're not, you haven't performed well. But they've actually found, uh, they actually have created a body of knowledge around this and that actually, that actually has created value. Well, that that's really sense? where, where the, the true meaning of the word pivot comes from. Yeah is if that thing fails, yet there's learning in there that actually forms the basis of a new project. But again, you know, if you, you're making a promise to somebody, what's the minimum functionality that's, gonna re, that's going to uh, fulfill that promise becomes your minimum viable product, then you should be able to create a hypothesis that says, this is what people are gonna do will indicate satisfaction. And so, uh, in the different various startup stages, the validated learning that you're using could be number of customers that have indicated that they're passion. I'm seeing a viral coefficient of you know, 0.7. Uh, I've got you know, 1,000 uh, customers within this specific market segment. Um, so it's measuring user passion, and then it's measuring you know, number of users based upon what you think you should be seeing, and then it starts getting into, well, how much does it cost for me to acquire them, and what's the lifetime value, and can I shrink the sales cycle that increases the velocity, the velocity of customer passion? Um, and so these are the things that you want to, and this, this stuff only really works when you have buy-in from the top, because you, there are all of these metrics that you have to prove before profitability. But the moment you measure profitability first, then I mean that's almost a guarantee of failure because you know it's less less popular than a black swan that somebody can stumble across some new disruptive that starts producing money quickly. So that I mean does that answer at all what you're trying to get at? Well, it's always contextual, right? So. I mean, let's say it was, I had some, um, said I, I had a community site with user-generated content, right? An appropriate metric might be time spent on site or bounce rate or what have you, right? It's gotta be, because you could say, 
I could say, hey, uh, hey, Brant, you know, looks like I had 10,000 visitors, and on average, they spent 25 minutes you know, per day. I know that's pretty good. Something's happening. I haven't made any money on these guys yet, but like, the fact that anyone's spending 25 minutes on my site, that's, that's actually like, non-trivial. Let's dig in further, right? Yeah. Hey, Patrick. Brent, thanks for being here. Great. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so the question I have is around selecting the market segment. So say I have an MVP, I did whatever survey thing, I did some market segment. What, what is it? What's, the, what's your objective in terms of that? Uh, so I can go deeper and find out more of those, find, find more of those segments. So we, yeah, we didn't really touch on market segments yep. at all, but basically, you know, first thing we usually talk about is that market segments defined by people that share the same problem or passion, so it's not demographics, it's not I'm going after a particular vertical or firmographics. People who share the same pain or passion and speak the same language, which means that they would refer to each other for solutions. So if you're going out there and you're running these purpose-built experiments to test these different market, segmentation, market segments, then we, we talk about the book just a simple back of the napkins approach of using a segment matrix so you can list your different market segments based on uh, rows and then your columns are different ways to evaluate those market segments. Could be depth of pain, uh, how easy are they, are they to reach in terms of marketing, do they have budget if that's necessary, uh, how easy is it to build an MDP for this particular market segment, or even what are your particular personal values or corporate values. Here's a market segment that's important to us, here's one eh, it's not that important to us. Rank them all high, medium, and low inside of this matrix. Go out and validate that your, your estimations, estimations are, are about right. Usually two, one or two market segments sort of rises to the top as ones that, you know, based on your own evaluation, look like they would be the right market segments to go after. Sometimes I counsel that you might do like a 70-20-10 approach, put 70% of your resources into the top segment, 20% into a second segment, let the rest be opportunistic, go out and try to you know, validate whether this is gonna be a winning segment, and if not, you've got the second one that's sort of already, already in motion, and you've got you know, the 10% opportunistic that you can raise up to being the second one again. So that might be one approach. In the, in the book, we talk about the jobs to be done model, which is uh, something, jobs to be done model of segmentation, which is uh, Clayton Christensen and his colleagues developed that. Um, and it's, what's, what are you hiring the product for? So the, so the classic example is, as a customer, if I buy a quarter inch drill bit, what am I really buying, right? I'm buying a quarter inch hole, right? And so you look at that, you look at segmentation through that model, what's the problem you're solving? And uh, uh, that is actually very insightful. We talk about that in the book too. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank All you. Right, thank you.